big component of a successful zoo or wildlife park is the educational outreach. Um, you know, educating people on site. So people who are there giving talks, having the information cards up so people learn this stuff is so, I mean, it is, it's, it's the most important thing because if you're not educating people, then, then they don't understand. Welcome. This is the Into the Wilderness podcast. I am your host, Byron Pace. It is the 19th of April, 2021. I recorded this interview, I think, in the middle of February. It is with Jake Willers. He is a documentary filmmaker and one of the people behind Nine Caribou Productions. And you're going to hear all about how his production company got that name in this interview. We talk across a broad suite of topics from how he got into filmmaking, which it's something that I get asked about all the time because it's part of my life too. And everybody has a slightly different story. There is no sort of regimented route into uh, filmmaking. But there's this one common theme that the people who do it are really, really passionate about. It, and that comes across in this interview with Jake. Uh, we really delve into it. And th this is something that I, I've been desperate to speak to somebody about who has knowledge uh, and, a, and a depth of understanding is about conservation and zoos and conservation and wildlife parks. Uh, and that is how Jake started his career. His, his family have a wildlife park down in England. So we really delve into that and, and try and understand it better and, and why it's important and, and the, the places that do it well and the places that don't do it well. We dive into conversations about the, the many years that he spent filming bears and filming mountain lions we talk about his master filmmaking courses, and as we get towards the the end of the the interview, uh, we discuss a recent documentary that he made, all about wildlife crossings, which is something that is applicable around the world, uh, and it's a, a really hard hitting short doc, which you will be able to find on his website on Nine Caribou Productions. Now, just a couple of things to mention before we dive into the show. We are running a competition, as we do every week. Now, two weeks ago, uh, we announced this competition in collaboration with Tecovis Boots to win a pair of their new Tecovis Stockton work cowboy boots, which I have a pair. And it's basically all I've been wearing since I came back from the US about six weeks ago, two months ago, or whenever it was. And I actually bought a pair of Tecovis boots about a year ago, but they're too nice to be outside cutting wood in. They're not work boots. They're made of gator skin and they look really nice and I love them, uh, but I can't wear them all the time. So when uh, this opportunity came up, which is in collaboration with, with Modern Huntsman, because uh, we've been doing some work with them with the publication, uh, they suggested, would you like to give a pair of boots away to your listeners on the podcast? And I was like, I'm sure they would love the opportunity, uh, but I don't have a pair. So it's not a problem. We're going to send you a pair so at least you can talk about them. So... I love my boots, and now I would like one of you to win a pair of their boots. So all you have to do is share this podcast on some social media platform somewhere. Either share the uh, wall post on Instagram or just find it yourself. Share if you're listening to it on Spotify. Just go and share that on your Facebook or share it on your Instagram or your Twitter. And just make sure you tag me at Byron J. Pace. That's pretty much where I am everywhere so that I can see that you've done it. And in two weeks' time... I will pick somebody at random from all the people who have shared over the four-week period. And one of you will have a pair of Stockton Tecovis boots sent out to you. Now, don't forget, every podcast listener gets a discount on the Modern Huntsman website. So it's pretty much everything there. I think the only thing you don't get a discount on is the prints because that's a different collab with, with different artists. Um, but all of the Modern Huntsman products, you get 15% off. So just use the discount code into the wilderness. Go on and have a look. Modern Huntsman are our partners on the podcast and have been for a long time now. I am also the conservation editor for that publication. So head over to modernhuntsman.com. There's a lot of online content there now. Uh, we are busy working on volume seven and volume one to six is on the site. So if you haven't yet had your hands on a copy, go and check it out online and order yourself a copy and use the discount code into the wilderness. 
I often forget to mention, but if you want to check out what I'm doing in the two weeks in between each one of these shows, then uh, I, I'm getting trying to get better at social. Uh, but I do post quite a bit on Instagram stories. So if you head over to at Byron J. Pace, uh, you can see what I've been doing, which for the last four weeks has basically been working on a project with the Atlantic Salmon Trust, which is a really interesting, fascinating tracking project. In fact, if you go back and search for Mark Billsby, Atlantic Salmon Trust, you can find a podcast that we did about 18 months ago that talks about it, which was the, the first year of the tracking project. And now I'm actually filming and documenting it for this season. Uh, so we've done some very cool things with big marine deployments out to past the Isle of Skye and out to the Isle of Barra, putting these acoustic receivers in the ocean. So I've been busy filming this documentary, and there will be a really interesting six-part mini-series on the podcast as well, speaking to different scientists about salmon conservation. So I'm going to start recording that in the next week or two and hopefully be bringing that to you soon. And just as a last uh, shout out, of course, to Patreon, uh, Patreon supporters are so, so important to me and all of your interaction. Quite a lot of you have told me that you want one of the prints that I have available on Patreon. So if you go over to patreon.com forward slash Byron Pace, you can have a look at all the tiers and ways that you can help support the podcast. And right now I'm giving away a, uh, a print to anybody who wants one on Patreon of two salmon leaping that I took uh, a year ago or... Uh, I guess six months ago, actually, on the North Esk in Scotland. So, yeah, go over and check it out. If you are a top-tier Patreon, then I shout your name out every show. And the top-tier Patreons for this month are Richard Stevens, Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of RDContracting.co.uk, James Marchington, the guys at South Ayrshire Stalking, Josh Starling, Thomas Cameron, Mark Zabrowski, the team at Galax Clothing, and Colin Knight. So thank you so much for your support and everybody who supports on Patreon, thank you for sending me emails and messaging me on the different socials. Uh, I love to hear from you, and thank you for sharing the show. If you would like to support the show in another way other than Patreon, then the two best things that you can do is share the show, either on social, and this week it means that you will also be in with a chance of winning a pair of Tacova's boots, or, or send it to a friend, or rate and review it. That makes a huge difference. So that is it. I think you've heard enough from me. Please welcome Jake Willers to the podcast. Jake, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. What what part of the world are you joining me from today? I've I've, I've I seem to have dotted the globe in the last week with different guests. It's been exciting right. hearing what's happening in different parts of the world. Absolutely, yeah. Well, good morning, Byron. Yeah, I'm in um, I'm in Nevada. I'm just actually Nevada with a British accent. What's going on? Uh, right, yeah. I, I used to say I used to say Nevada, uh, but living here now for 14 years, I've gotten a lot of trouble. You know, um, it first started, I think, in a bar. I was in the oldest bar <laughs> in Nevada, or Nevada, or Nevada rather so, back then, right? I was in the oldest bar in Genoa, and uh, it's like a I don't know, 150 years old, something like that. And um, I they had there's a beer called Sierra Nevada, which you I'm sure I know mm -hmm. of. And um, I ordered one at the bar, and a guy next to me kind of elbowed me, and he goes, "It's Nevada, not Nevada." Okay, so, you so know, I, need uh, to I need to mentally log this now. Right. It's <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Make so, sure I get it right. Uh, and it happened a few times, you know, going different places. So now I am a Nevadan. Uh, so it's a Nevadan. Nevadan. Yeah. Okay. And um, so England to Nevada, what, what brought you to the other side of the world? Well, originally it was filming. So uh, I okay. came out to uh, Nevada in um, 2005 uh, to film Black Bears with National Geographic Channel. And, um, and I met then uh, my now wife, who was actually volunteering on a, a bear project with the Department of Wildlife. And um, long story short, we, we met again a year later uh, when she actually came out and helped us as a PA, a, a production assistant, on a shoot in the Amazon in Peru, uh, filming macaws and army ants. And, uh, and that was it. And then after three weeks in the jungle together, um, it was another year of long distance relationship before I moved out to, to Nevada. And that was, uh, so love took you to the other side of the world. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it <laughs> I mean, I don't think there's a better and, reason. <laughs> yes. No, this is it. This is it. No, it's, um, and it's a wonderful place to be. Oh, I've never been. I've never been. I mean, I've, I've been to a lot of different places in the States, but I've never been there. So it's still on the list. 
Yeah, you know, it's um, it has its own charm. It's it's high desert, pretty much. It, it's the most mountainous state in the contiguous U.S. So second to uh, Alaska, if you take the whole of the states, but the first in in terms of contiguous. Um, it's very very dry. Uh, there's only three million people, I believe, in Nevada, that's which nothing. is yeah, it's like that's the amount of people that commute into London, I think, every day. Or it's probably more now. It was like that twenty years ago, but um, but yeah, I, I'm just off the the side of Lake Tahoe, so it's it's stunning. If you've not seen Lake Tahoe, highly recommend it sometime. Uh, beautiful alpine lake, uh, about twenty miles long, ten miles wide, and stunning, really stunning. Uh, one of the things I want to speak to you about is uh, what was actually it was in your email when, when you reached out to me, which is this new short doc that you've got about road crossings because I think there's I mean there's road crossings specifically where we're talking about right now yeah. um, but in the US but it's applicable around the world but before we get to that you talked about filmmaking filmmaking black bears for National Geographic um, previously based back in uh, in the UK. How did filmmaking come about for you? Because I, I get asked this question quite a lot uh, from people who want to do it as a as a career, and I, I I'm I am I always say I'm not the right person to ask because I actually do a lot of different things, and filmmaking is one you know one part of many. But you know, I speak to people like yourselves on the, yourself on the podcast, or I had uh, Nick Baker on not that long ago. Not that he's a filmmaker, but he's a presenter, so he's working like in the film space. And it, it it looks from the outside like such a dream job for people who are enthused and excited by wildlife and want to tell uh, wildlife stories in particular, which is obviously your focus as well. Uh, what was your journey into it? So I started out running a, a wildlife park in the UK, just just a village called Shepworth, just outside of Cambridge. And um, I actually grew up on the park. So it was my father and stepmother that started it back um, in the 70s um, by buying a piece of land and it just kind of forming into this place where they took in native wildlife um, to rehabilitate. It was injured wildlife they rehabilitated and released. Um, and it ended up turning into a wildlife park where we had the public walking around and, and coming to see the animals. Um, and it's now one of East Anglia's largest kind of wildlife parks and attractions. So I managed that for around 15 years, actually kind of running it. Um, and in that time, around the year 1999, 2000-ish, I curated an insect house called Waterworld and Bug City. It was a mixture of fish and reptiles and insects, but primarily insects. And I, I, I spent about three to four months actually physically building it because we built all of our own enclosures and um, we were, my father was a builder by trade. So um, that's what actually kept the park going over all these years is being able to do all of our own building of, of enclosures. So um, I grew up with that skill set. I curated this, um, this insect house and uh, we launched it. And within about the first six months of it being launched and getting a lot of press, um, both you know local newspapers and national TV, I had a production company reach out to me and they came along to do some small stories on some of the insect species that we had in there. Um, and during the time they were there, they filmed some interviews with me. And then a few weeks later, they reached back out and said, look, we, we really like these interviews we did. We feel like you would make a good presenter for TV. Would you be interested? And, well, right place, right time. That's yeah. almost the same story as for Nick. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And I think it is for so many, you know. Um, but I had never even thought about it. And um, and so I said to them, well, look, you know, I, I don't, and they said, you know, if you're interested, we could come along and do a promo, you know, and, and see if we get this thing going. Now, I was working six to seven days a week, right? I'd work seven days. I'd have a day off every two weeks, basically. Uh, and I was working anywhere from 12 to 15, maybe even 18 hour days sometimes. It was, you know, insane, my schedule, because, you know, we had a lot of wildlife and um, sometimes we were short staffed. So I just didn't see how I could possibly fit it in. And so I said to them, look, as long as it doesn't interrupt my day job at the wildlife park, I'm happy to oblige and, you know, see what happens. So they came along early, about 5 a.m. one morning, and we, we filmed this uh, kind of promo, just a, a couple of minute promo. And they, they took it off to National Geographic, and lo and behold, within about three months, we had a six-part series with National Geographic. 
Oh, that's amazing. Um, yeah. <laughs> so from 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 zero presenting experience whatsoever, three months later, you're presenting stuff on on National Geographic. Yep, National Geographic International as well, which was uh, goes out to 147 countries, or well, probably more now. It was back then. So um, what was that series? So that was called Insects from Hell. That was the okay. first series, and that was a uh, that was a six part series, um, and then that was so popular. We we ended up doing a one hour special in between, and then we had another seven part series from Insects from Hell uh, series two, um, and then we went on to do a diversify, and it wasn't just insects at that point. We we moved into you know every, all sorts of species. So we did Rogue Raiders, which is where I filmed the black bears in in Nevada, uh, and then went on to do Wild Events, which was some of the biggest spe- wildlife spectacles and migrations in the world so um, so i really fell into it uh you know and um i say never expected it i think it happens this way for so many people um you know on my podcast where i interview wildlife filmmakers everyone's story is similar but very different right similar from the point of view that they were either a scientist and they found they had a greater outreach by getting into tv or it just fell into their lap and you know they made a career change and um you know that that tends to be the way into this uh, for so many people where did your because you know i've seen you presenting a number of things like some of the programs that you've just mentioned and you know it's it's clear that you have a, a depth of knowledge in the subjects which is a, a, a very wide spectrum of subjects and species did that come from working in the park in a general interest or is this something you had to accumulate along the way you know a bit of both i mean it definitely came from working at the wildlife park um you know i i didn't actually do very good in school at all you know i, I struggled at reading i struggled at writing um i I spent my weekends working at the wildlife park or with my my father uh, building, you know, in the times when he was building before the wildlife park really took off. Um, and so what happened was I had this, I, I kind of went back to school very tired <laughs> every Monday morning <laughs> from working from, you know, from a young age. And, uh, and I just didn't do very well in school. So what happened was when I left and I started working at the wildlife park, I really, my passion for wildlife and um, insects, especially, really took off. And at that point, I really started to see the value of educating myself. You know, I really hadn't seen the value of it before, which, you know, was uh, terrible, you know, from the time that I was in school up to 16, 17 years old. Um, But once I started educating myself by reading books, um, you know, traveling and just uh, speaking to scientists and people doing research on various species, um, this whole new world of knowledge opened up to me and I absorbed it like a sponge at that point. Uh, And it really just took off. I mean, it was incredible uh, how fast you know you can really learn when you have i mean passion is you know highly overused these days but at the end of the day you know if you're passionate about a subject and you throw yourself in wholeheartedly and that becomes your focus then you know that that's that's where the knowledge comes from i I didn't sit at home playing video games or you know watching a lot of tv I, i would read books and um and really just observe you know i had a scorpion um an imperial scorpion when i was about 11 years old as a pet I had a corn snake, um, various other things as I grew up. And I just observed and was fascinated by behavior of wildlife, uh, whatever it might be. And, um, and that really gave me that knowledge that uh, I implement today. It, it's so very true what you say there, because I think that if I think back to my time at school, and I, I, was, I was pretty good at school, like, you know, I got good grades and stuff, and it, it was more just through um an application of like c- competitiveness more than anything else that's always what i've kind of put it down to but if i compare that ki- that kind of mode of learning where you're presented with stuff in front of you because you have to learn it you have no choice you're at school there's a certain curriculum you got to do your math you got to do physics you got to do chemistry blah 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 and all the rest of it in comparison to this uh, self-learning and absorbing information, because it's something that I'm incredibly passionate about and want to learn about, your ability to retain and then explain that information, there there is no comparison to those two different modes of learning. And it, it's, it's, 
it's like you can learn things, but to really learn things, you have to understand the topics. And there's a big difference between learning something and understanding it. And you only, I, I've only really understood things that I've also had this underlying passion for. And so I, I think what you're talking about there, there's a huge value in acknowledging that there's a need for for self education, and I think that the the, the information that you um, absorb in that way stays with you far longer than anything that you simply just learn. Yeah, and I you know I think a lot of it is, um, and I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but neuroplasticity, right? The, in the last decade or two, um, we have learned so much more about how the brain works. And I think when you're in school and you're being thrown subjects, you don't have an interest in it just goes in one ear and out the other ear as the saying goes. And you're not really building any gray matter to retain that information. But when you're passionate and you just you're constantly looking at the same stuff and learning, 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 you're building those neural pathways that end up retaining that information. And so the more I learn about the brain, I'm fascinated because I can see that that's how my brain's working. You know, I know just to, to stay on track with something I'm interested in and it, it will stick. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny, actually, because when, you, when you're truly passionate about something, you do end up. Uh, reading or um, or watching or absorbing very similar information in slightly different ways. Not necessarily because you're you're trying to read the same thing again. It's just that in your quest to learn something new, you often have to sift through stuff you know know already. Yeah, for and sure. it really reinforces that like foundational part of, of understanding. Yeah, hundred percent, a hundred percent, and I think that's, you know, it, it's interesting that um, going back to when I was presenting for Nat Geo, uh, any of the facts that we showed or we we had it within the show that ended up being in the show um, in its entirety would would have to be verified by three separate sources. So, okay. um, and, and the reason for that was just that even you know printed books can have differing information and certainly as time goes on we learn more about a particular species and we find something was wrong and so if you just take one source you potentially could be wrong by the time the show's out um yeah. so and it's the same with learning you know you you can't just take it from one source because you just yeah you've you've got to do your research and work out what are the fundamentals of what you're trying to learn and the stuff that you know across all these sources is the same so we can be you know pretty much 100% sure that 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 fact is right um there, there there's something to be said for that just in in life in general because it's so easy to uh, see a story, whether that be on Twitter or somebody shares something on Instagram and, and this whole so, um, social media world, and just take it as given that that's true because it's in print. Maybe it's got a newspaper name attached to it that is respectable. But forcing yourself to verify that that same story exists from other sources has never been more important in this world where information is put out so rapidly. And anybody who's done, um, we don't really, I mean, this is a really important point because if I think back to um, up to the end of high school, I don't think that ability to, um, or the necessity to check uh, facts and understanding across sources is really reinforced. But once you go to university, especially if you're in sort of um, you know, towards the end of your undergrad or any studies that you do beyond that, it is drilled into you that you need to verify across multiple sources uh, and, and cite multiple sources. Uh, but I, I think it's maybe now in, in everyday life that's more applicable now than it ever has been especially after the last four years <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we've had a you know it's been a crazy run but i mean whatever side of the line you lie um you know th there's there's a need to understand the facts and you know make your decisions from there but just to take someone's you know, something at tweet. face value or someone's <laughs> tweet. Yeah, exactly. You know, just to take something for what it's worth, you know, there and then, it, it, yeah, it's not going to get you anywhere. You, you, I think too, I think it's a bad place for, 
kids growing up today to see that and just think that that's that's you know that's how we absorb information well if he said it it must be right yeah you know um it's it's not not a good place to be which is uh, and this is not to this is not to um dig into american politics at all but that is particularly true when um you have things being said by people of a certain st- standing in society whether and i am really where my brain was going there is you often see people with some sort of celebrity type status making statements about things that they actually don't really know anything about and it can be very damaging there was a there was an article in i want to say the guardian um a couple of weeks ago about celebrities uh, making statements uh, with regard to uh, wildlife conservation and actually how damaging that can be when they're misinformed. I mean, I don't doubt their heart's often in the right place, but I just think that the the nuances of some of these things get lost. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> yeah, I think so. I think... Um... You know, there is this trend of uh, a lot of celebrities wanting to be an ambassador for a charity or a nonprofit or something that they're into. But a lot of the time, if they're approached, you know, if it's not something they've been following for some time and they're approached by a nonprofit, it can seem like a great thing to do, you know, for to make them feel better and for their publicity and all of those kind of things. But if they don't understand exactly what it is, then absolutely you know you just uh, they don't have the information and that that can't be a good thing just to go back to the the wildlife park i want to ask you um because i actually don't really know anything about the the, the wild it, does it, it still exist does it it does yeah shepherd wildlife park yeah um because i have a i have a, a bit of a funny relationship with whether that be wildlife parks or the sort of more kind of what I would describe as a a zoo, which is sure. different to what a lot of zoos used to be. Historically, yeah. they're a hell of a lot better than they were like a hundred years ago or fifty, even fifty years ago. Yeah, um, because I really struggle with this idea of seeing wildlife in an environment that it shouldn't be in, that sure. it doesn't belong in. Yeah. Um, but equally, I understand the value of the public being able to see wildlife that they would otherwise not have the opportunity to see in person and how that can then inform their their decisions and thought processes and, and care of the wildlife in other parts of the world, if indeed it is a park that has wildlife there that isn't native to the country that it exists in. Um, yep. What is your kind of uh, mindset, having worked within a, a wildlife park, um, and the and the kind of zoo, more uh, and the zoo system uh, as it exists globally in general. Sure. Well, so first of all, there's th- there are different types of zoos and parks. Uh, we should kind of you know pref- preface this with definitely. That. Yeah. Um, you know there are the the types of parks that are very much being closed down now. We're seeing a lot of uh, zoo licensing. Uh, licenses being pulled around the world just based on the fact that they were there for monetary gain in the first place um you know and of course we've we've probably all heard of tiger king at this point <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> where my mind was going right yeah. yeah that is the epitome of what a zoo should not be <laughs> yes exactly and so you know th- those places were set up because someone was passionate about an animal and saw they could make money out of it and there there you go you know suddenly you've got this place that's earning money and they realize how valuable it is because people are coming in and spending their money but that money's not going to the right place right so so there's a few ways of looking at it. there's that kind of thing which is you know atrocious because at the end of the day the animals they might be kept well i mean i don't want to go down that road some are some aren't you know um but at the end of the day there's really no other reason for it being there than someone's love for a ma- animal and then profit. And then you've got the the other end of the scale, which is like a sanctuary, which is how ours started out, which is taking in injured wildlife, nurturing it back to health and releasing it if that's possible and if it should be released. And then in between, you've really got the zoo system as we know it today, which is, um, you know, basically there's a lot of ways animals end up in zoos. Um, some may be uh, moved between zoos because there's not enough room to home them uh, because of overbreeding, which is never a good thing. Um, 
most of the time now, zoos are trying to be in a place where, and, and I don't really keep up on it. I should say this now. I don't really keep up on it. I've been out of the system for 14, 15 years. So, you know, this is just my viewpoint over the kind of the history of time. But um, then you have your know, breeding programs and breeding programs are there essentially to help build the numbers up in captivity of animals, which are, um, you know, becoming uh, threatened and extinct in the wild uh, so that there is a population to keep a gene pool going. Now, there's th- that's another rabbit hole, you know, other stud books being kept correctly so that it's species it's, identifications over time yeah, yeah. Uh, you know are that uh, yes exactly and are they coming from the right place so there's no interbreeding and and that kind of thing but if it's done well then it works very well um, at the wildlife park the first ever breeding program we had was with the parchula snail which was a snail that was from the south pacific islands that got um uh they, they introduced the um a snail into the South Pacific Islands to get rid of the African, uh, the giant African land snail that was introduced back in the in wartime for food. Right? Oh, we so, do this so often around the world. Right, <laughs> bring one thing in and then try and correct it yeah, by introducing exactly. something else. So, so I, I took this on. It was actually um, with uh, in partnership with um, uh, the London London Zoological Society. And uh, and so we took some parchula snails on. The idea was that they they needed to you know reduce the uh, giant African land snails, but then the predatory snail that they put in or onto the islands ate the parchula snail, not the giant African land snails. So then it came to like physically removing them. And the point was really to build up you know numbers uh, around the world of these parchula snails for reintroduction. Um, and it was a quantity thing at that point because it really was just a case of they needed the quantity to. To, to get the numbers back up. Um, now, you know, slightly easier with a snail than it is, say, a, you know, a, a rhino or a tiger or, you know, any of these other larger threatened species. So, so at the end of the day, to answer your question, I think, you know, there, there's a broad spectrum of, of what's going on today. Slowly, the bad places are being closed down because, you know, I think as time goes on, people start seeing through the the veneer also of what these places are set up for. You know, if if a, a, a place is set up and they have a conservation aspect to them, if they're members of associations, um, zoo associations, and you know they have a regulation to stay to and uh, and licensing that they have to adhere to, then you know that that at the moment is the best that a place can be. And I think what we're starting to see, if they can't get into these associations, then they're starting to struggle because people start to realize there are regulations that need to be adhered to, to, to you know, run a, um, a, a zoo or a wildlife park that actually has more to it than just having public coming around and making money. Yeah, the, the conservation links between zoos and parks um, are incredibly important. And I, I think you're right. I think that... The public have never been more educated in that, and we are seeing the public making decisions based on more than just the experience that they can have going to a place. They do genuinely want to know more and more what good is being done. I I want to understand how this is benefiting uh, tigers or, I mean, pandas is the, the big flagship one in the wild and it can't just be for the spectacle for humans yeah and, and um, i think we're beyond that because that that is exactly what zoos were originally right. they were yeah. wild animals ripped from from sure. wherever it is that they belonged to be to be spectacles yes to yeah. to gawk at to make money and then yeah, we should i money. should add here that really that you know a big component of a successful zoo or wildlife park is the educational outreach um you know educating people on site so people who are there ha- giving talks having the information cards up so people learn this stuff is so i mean it is it's it's the most important thing because if you're not Agreed. educating people then then they don't understand but also the outreach where you actually go out to schools and give talks and and you know events um where you can go out and just you know um do outreach and get people get to a wider audience that is by far the most important part and the other half of your question was really you know are they are they important for people to learn a hundred percent i mean one you know i grew up with it and i was there but that has built my entire career 
because of my passion of learning about the wildlife that I had the fortunate, you know, um, ability to do. But then also from the point of view of the schools that we would have come in and the amount of kids that we would see eyes light up when they learned something about a particular species. And then the families that would come back, you know, year after year, decade after decade. Um, and, you know, we've got people coming back now with their kids who came when they were a kid and they come back because they love the park and they love what they learn and they love that they can go and learn something and actually see these uh, animals, you know, close up. Um, and I, I should add as well, Shepworth Wildlife Park, you know, one of the most important things as well as education is the uh, environments that the animals are kept in. You know, it's it's actually a very beautiful park and it's the, you know, that we've got some great keepers there. Uh, my family still run it, my sister now and my brother oh, um, both run it. My father's still there as well. Um, and that's their primary goal is to create a place that is not only nice for the public, but is 100% doing the best it can for the species it has there and so um i mean yeah. yeah if that's your if that's your goal that's uh yeah you can't go far wrong if you if you stick to that as a goal i wonder how have um how, how have they been managing over the last year with with people not being able to actually come through the door with restrictions uh terribly you know it's it must um, be really tough yeah it's really tough um because the costs i the costs to keep a place like that running exist whether people are coming through or not yes the costs are astronomical um the the wildlife park through the time when i left school and and started working there full time um for about 10 years we were on the brink of bankruptcy at least five times um, and it was only my father's uh, construction building skills that were able to keep it going. It was constantly going out and working, building a home or renovating a house or, you know, building a garage for someone that kept the place going. That was subsidizing it all the way through. The, what what happened is we we built it, then the time that I was there, we built it from about 15,000 visitors a year to 100,000 visitors a year in, a, in around a 10 to 15 year period. And once we got to those kind of numbers, it became a going concern where it really could, you know, fend for itself financially. But then what, what people don't really see with a place like that is you have to make all your money, you know, you, you make hay when the sun shines, right? <laughs> and the wildlife park being primarily outside, it's when the sun shines in the UK, that's when people <laughs> come around the wildlife often. park, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> So, you know, the bank holidays, the summer holidays, school holidays, those kind of times are so essential to put the coffers in the bank to be able to get through the hard times, which is the winter when no one's coming around or very few people are coming around. So you build up this buffer that then you, you know, you're paying uh, to feed the animals and give them veterinary care and, and everything that goes with it, pay the staff uh, through the hard times. Then, you know, that, that works very well as a system until an event like a pandemic. Actually, the last event before this, I remember, was foot and mouth. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, when, yeah, when that hit the UK, we, had to, we closed down. Uh, I, can't, I think it was close to a month that we closed down. And then when we opened up, we had to put foot baths in. So we had those chlorine foot baths. I remember, Every, yeah. yeah. Everyone had to walk through before they came in and before they left. And um, and that was really hard, but that was only a few months. Um, this pandemic has hit them hard. So it's only been through generous donors um, helping to keep the park going by people still, still buying subscriptions to go, you know, a season ticket. Um, and, and not expecting anything back. Um, you know, we're the same here with my, my kids, we buy a subscription to the science museum here in, uh, in Nevada. And, uh, of course, you know, this year we've not been able to go, but you, the last thing you'll do is ask for your money back, right? Because that's how they keep going. So, and that, that's the same with the wildlife. Yeah. Part. Do you want them to be there when everything turns back to, yeah. to normal? Uh, you've, it, and it's a re it's really hard because everybody's, well, most people are really struggling right now. I mean, Especially if you were, if you're a freelancer and work in yeah. film and photography and all the rest of it, because you can't, your job is traveling, and we can't travel right now. So, it's it's completely understandable why, especially a year later, people are are looking at what comes out of their bank account and thinking, well, I don't need that subscription anymore. Yeah, I can definitely do without spending all this, but. 
Yeah, it's it is important to point out that uh, these businesses and and these things that we enjoy doing when we can get back to normal may not exist anymore. I mean, there's businesses closing around the world on a daily basis. Yeah, thousands absolutely. of them. Yeah, maybe tens of thousands of them globally because they just can't exist anymore. Yeah, it's it's frightening. Um, it really is. It's a it's a reset for sure um, in so many ways. And as you said, you know, being a freelancer, I mean, it's happening everywhere. If you own a restaurant, you're being hit hard. If you're, you know, wherever you are, you're being hit hard. Some more than others, just because of the nature of of work. And yeah, as freelancers, we. Uh, you know, we we don't have much work coming in. So, and as you say, restricted travels and, and what have you. So, yeah, it's it's I think hard across the board. Just to switch gears back to, I want to talk about your production company. So, we we got as far as you presenting, but you actually have a production company now, Nine Caribou Productions. Uh, first of all, I got to ask you about the name. Yeah. Um, so the name comes from uh, it was a. Uh, we, we were filming, I mentioned earlier, um, a series called Wild Events. And for Wild Events, we had um, we had a, a, an extra episode, I'll call it. It never made it to the final series. But it was to go and film the uh, caribou migration, the second largest migration in the world, um, closely um, followed, uh, sorry, well, it's second to the wildebeest migration in Africa. And they're, they're very close. And so- oh, how, many, how many animals is it? It's somewhere around 1.5 million animals that, that move. And there are different herds all over um, the Northwest Territories and Alaska that move. So incredible. I'd love to see but, it. I'd, yeah. It looks incredible. Interesting, just as a, a small side note, I've discovered just a couple of days ago i think it was an article in national geographic that the largest mammal migration in the world is actually bats across central right, africa yes. it's about four and a half yep. million so i guess this would be third <laughs> yeah yeah well i don't know yeah I, yeah i guess the third but i'd never it's the first time i'd ever read that because yeah. in my mind it is always wildebeest and yeah um you know in, in africa well and, and this is the yeah. thing i mean science is always finding something new and i guess now having the technology to count those bats has probably you know is bringing this information to light yeah maybe they just weren't aware sorry anyway yeah. I, I broke your train of thought that's right um carib caribou caribou, caribou yeah so um cut long story short basically we went out to film the migration but the entire trip was a complete disaster for three weeks um, basically due to um, the outfitter uh, going, having all sorts of problems, leaving us abandoned, uh, not being able to... <laughs> forth- you guess you never used them again. No, no. Uh, we, we, we weren't able to... We, we, the idea was to be flown in and out of the area from a, a base camp to where the, the caribou were migrating. And then we would be left for a few days at a time to film, just myself and a camera guy. And, uh, and it never happened. Um, you know, with all sorts of problems with the outfitters, we, we couldn't get out to where they were. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of details to this, but to, needless to say that on, uh, while we were at camp, one caribou walked into camp right that was the only (laughs) caribou i saw at camp while i was there for three weeks and then flying out going you know leaving i saw eight caribou from no i love the story i would have (laughs) never have guessed that was how this name came about so so i I set out to film over a million caribou and i saw (laughs) nine individuals yeah um i mean i i Given that you now have a production company called Nine Caribou Productions, I, I think that trip was a success. Yes, absolutely. That's that's what I tell everyone. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. So what was the um, – why? Why did you feel like you, you wanted to move into this part of the, the wildlife documentary space, not just being in front of the camera but also being behind it and putting whole stories together? You know, I – I, as, as I said earlier, I never really looked to get into presenting. So presenting found me and I really enjoyed it. What, what I found I loved was one, the travel, you know, to just travel the world, um, see new cultures, places, meet new people was astonishing. You know, that is a dream job. Um, and then to be able to be the face of a series and present on something that you love and that you're passionate about, again, a dream job, completely loved it. The more, however, that I was part of that, the more I saw the bigger picture of 
um, really the creative side of it um, and having more control over the creative side. I, I don't like using the word control really because it, it's not it's not that I didn't feel in control, right? You know, but you have you, the ability to shape it more when you're creating yes. uh, the production yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And 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 I think you know, just once I learned and once I was part of that um, that world of wildlife filmmaking, I saw the potential of it. And <clears throat> as a presenter, you know, really, you are you're part of a team, which is fantastic. We had a great team. I loved. You know, we were a small, around a five person team, and it grew to thirteen people depending on what. What we were doing and where we were going. Um, but I love traveling with these people. They were like my second family. Um, and, you know, and yeah, it was just such an enjoyable experience. But the more I learned, the more I wanted to have more creative control and be in a place where I could, uh, you know, I could suddenly see another story and go, well, this story over here, I would love to tackle. But that's not what we're doing as a production company. And so, um, and we, and also the production company were doing lots of other wild, non wildlife related programming. So there were times, you know, we would be out doing very much spending, say, the summer filming a, a see, uh, either a one, one hour special or a season, a series. Um, and then, you know, the winter would be spent, I'd be back at the wildlife park and they'd be working on non wildlife based stuff. Um, and, and so it just, yeah, I, I got the, this um this bug in me that uh very much like so many people in the industry do i could just see the potential of what i could do with this if i was a camera person and a producer and maybe a host as well but just you know moving around within that kind of that whole um world of you know everything other than just a presenter so what was the what was the first big uh project and story that you that you picked up uh, on the back of setting up your production company? You know, so there wasn't really one defining thing that that happened from that point of view. What it was was um, I, start, I carried on filming bears. So I moved from the UK, and this was really where it all, it all took place. So I, I left the wildlife park, left it with the rest of my family. Um, I got married and moved to Nevada, where my wife uh, was from. And at that point, I started the production company and continued to film uh, black bears because that's what the, the, the species that my wife was involved in up until that point. Um, but then she started, she embarked on her PhD with mountain lions. And this was to, it ended up being a seven year project, um, collaring with GPS satellite collars, uh, mountain lions around Nevada. And it was oh, wow. the first project on lions in 40 years in Nevada. So it was very much in need of an update of the data and, you know, for management purposes. Um, and so I, I then stepped into the role of being technician, if you like, on that project and filming it as well as helping with the background I had of being able to tranquilize animals uh, at the wildlife park. Um, you know, I would help the vets that came in. We had a lot of vets at the time who weren't uh, zoo vets coming in. And so they had it's a whole other skill, the it, tranquilizing side of it. It yeah, really I've done is, a little bit yeah. of it as well. And so, so we were trained, you know, as uh, I was trained as uh, someone who could use a blowpipe and a, an applicator to tranquilize animals. Um, and so I would do that when the vets came in, then the vets would do what they needed to, to do. Uh, and so I bought that skill set to uh, my wife's project. And so we were able then to con combine our skills and go out and the two of us over a five year period of, of the actual field work, uh, captured and collared uh, 50, 50 adults and around 20 cubs. So about I think what was, an amazing project. Yeah, it was inc absolutely incredible. And then, and then after that, we, or during that time as well, but in the second or the latter part of the project, we would hike out to all of the kill sites that we w would recognize from the mapping of their GPS collars and see what they were feeding on. So a big part component of that research was to look at prey selection. And so we we went into over 1300 kill sites um, to look at what these, these guys were eating. So the first five to seven years that I was here, that I started the production company, I was very heavily involved in filming mountain lions and black bears, but to no real end, 
right? I mean, there was an end. We were actually, we were in talks with the BBC about a mountain lion show that never came to fruition like so many shows don't. Um, but really it was gathering footage at that point because um, we also had the project and the project was of paramount importance. After that, I then got really hooked into the urban bears, the the black bears that were in rural, uh, sorry, in, uh, coming from rural areas into urban areas or in the human wildlife, wildland interface. So where the bears come out of the mountains down and start coming into the suburbs and, and the cities. And that fascinated me because it was something that we had filmed, you know, a few years earlier. But it was happening all the time. And as droughts were happening throughout California and Nevada, it would happen more and more. And then what started to happen was I was being, you know, sought out for my footage by news channels to when, you know, there were big bear stories coming up and the, the drought would instigate that. Um, and so I was selling a ton of that footage to networks and um, news channels all over the world. Uh, then I went into making a show locally for uh, the Washoe County Health District about the bears. Uh, that ended up being a 20-minute documentary about the situation. Um, and then, you know, I could go on and on about this, but um, really what happened was I was at a place where we, we were having uh, kids at the time. And you know, one of the things about working in this industry, as you know, is travel is a massive component, right? You know, as a presenter for Nat Geo, I was traveling um, all the time, you know, going to, I've been to 38 countries now. Um, and, and, you know, many of them I've been to over and over for filming. One of the biggest problems I found was, you know, having a lifestyle like that, you're away from your family a lot. Yeah. And I, you know, speaking to so many filmmakers now, this is, you know, when you start out in this industry, especially if you're young and you're single, it's... Oh, it's everything you want. Yeah, <laughs> it's everything, right? Yeah. But then as you get older and you have a family, you start scratching your head going, okay, what now? How do I do this? And and still love it, but not miss my family and not, you know, and give my family enough time. And that became really the most important thing to me. Uh, was spending time with family. So what I started to do was work more on a local basis and say, okay, I, I can't go. I actually turned down multiple filming opportunities and hosting opportunities because it meant me heading out to Africa or India or somewhere. Um, and that was, a hard it, yeah, for, that was a hard choice. I was about to say, I mean, I, 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 I think I understand uh, the, the draw and the desire when that's something you've always done. And, and clearly it, it's, it's somewhere very deep seated in who you are, because that's we've been so much of your life going to these places and telling these stories. To so to turn that down is difficult, even even when it's this uh, this choice, which isn't really a choice, because obviously you're going to spend time, you know, or you, there's a, a a need and a deep desire to spend time with with a family, especially if you have a young family. Yeah, uh, but it's still hard. It really is. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, imagine it's hard. I haven't had to make that choice right. yet, but I imagine it's very hard. You know, as you said, it kind of it goes against all your your principles and your, you know, your everything inside you is telling you, you know, you've made this career. You've had this incredible career. And now you're at this point of turning down opportunities. And yeah. you know the twenty-year-old version of you would be going so yeah, mad. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's like, yeah. what are you doing? But you know, priorities change. So uh, they as do, much absolutely. as as much as I'm saying this was hard, the first time it was hard. The first time it was like, oh my gosh, and I'd sit down with my wife and discuss it, and I'm like, you know, I'm turning down the money, I'm turning down the experience, the opportunity, all of those things. I mean, being paid to travel and do what you <laughs> love, right? That's what everyone aspires it's like to. It, is that a job? Right. People do that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so every, you know, wh whatever you do, you aspire to be able to do something along those lines, right? Yeah, yeah. And so to turn that down felt like it was going against every cell in my body. But there were the other cells, if you like, that were saying, you know, you have a family now and this is actually the most important thing to you. And I've had an incredible run as a presenter and I have an incredible. So at that point, it was like, if it all ended overnight, it would be a shame, but this is my priority. 
but but really what I looked at doing was how can I take everything that I have, all the experience I have in this industry, and how can I now turn it on its head and make it work for me, right? Rather than worry about what I'm missing out on, what can I look forward to? How can I turn this around? Yeah, what can you create? Yeah. And so that really led into one working on a local basis for wildlife nonprofits and not even just at that time, you know, I looked at ways of how can I keep filming and earn a living. And so I actually turned to the commercial world for quite some time. To, I know that world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To bring the money in. And um, what that enabled me to do is it enabled me to keep a camera in my hand. Right. Instead of going off and saying, no, I've got to go and do this job now. Right. I've got to go and build garages, right, to subsidize the wildlife world that I've been in. Uh, you know, that's the world I came from. It was subsidizing all the time, doing something different. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. If I'm going to subsidize, I'm going to subsidize with a camera because that keeps my experience level up. It keeps, you know, it keeps me on the right track, if you like, just diverting very slightly. And so anyway, long story short, that's what I did. I, I filmed commercials, uh, you know, and I, I, I kept the money coming in just by doing that commercial work. Uh, and then that led me into, you know, getting, having the time to build relationships with nonprofits, do work for them, um, but also looking at other sides of things. And so one of the things was, you know, starting the, the and I'm jumping timeline here quite a lot, but just trying to give you a whole idea of what's been happening. Um, starting the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast was very much about how can I now take what I know and help people in the industry. Because When did very, you start that, Jake? So that originally started 2017, but then we okay. had a hiatus because of getting super busy with filming. Um, and so it, it was off the cards for about a year and then restarted last year. So oh. now it's a monthly episode going out. Um, and it's, You've had some amazing guests on there. We really have, yeah, really yeah. have. Um, got some. R Rob's a friend who you had mo on on most recently. Yeah, Rob Nelson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, I was on guy. the phone to him just yesterday. Yeah, really great. I did an amazing podcast with him as well. Uh, and you got a whole bunch of people on there who I who I definitely I, I might uh, pick, pick your brains for the contacts because I'd love to have them on mine as well. Absolutely. It's, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. It's I. It's it's great to to get those insights from people, you know, like the conversation that we're having from people who have been immersed in it for so long and who yeah. are making a career out of it. Well, and like you said, there's very few places, you know, you get a question a lot about how do you break into the industry? And the whole premise for starting that podcast was to show, you know, rather than tell people this is how you break in, was to show how everyone else broke in. Because um, there is no, because there, there is no exactly, standardized way. Exactly. There's yeah. no blueprint. There's no floor plan or, or or plan that with arrows on that just shows you, hey, do this. You know, jump these hurdles and you'll be in. But there is quite a, um, a similarity with how everyone's got into it, and there certainly are things that you can do to better your chances. And so with the podcast, that was kind of like my educational outreach, if you like, similar to what we were doing at the wildlife park but for wildlife filmmaking. And then on top of that, I started up a mentoring group, the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Mentoring Group, which is subscription-based people. Um, I go live once a week to my group uh, and answer all their questions. And those quite questions, they can direct straight at me, whether it's about how they're breaking into the industry or they're having a problem with this technology or the, you know storytelling. And they're, that's available on your website, isn't it? That is, yeah. 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 And... Um, you know, that has been so incredibly valuable for a few reasons. One, I love sharing my experience and I know how the other person on the other end is feeling because I was once there, right? So I love being able to give the, you know, the information out that I've, accu you know, accumulated over the last 20 years in this industry. Um, but also it's diversifying my income stream, if you like. Going back to what I was saying about how do I make this work for me? Well, now, you know, by creating all multiple streams of income based around the same industry, it keeps me in the industry, but not having to travel as much as I used to, to be in the industry. So it's really, you know, trying to just look at different ways to make it work, but at the same time, have the same impact out in the world. Yeah, no, I, I have a very similar mindset, actually, but and have done kind of since the beginning 
um, because I, so I, I suppose what I really started doing in this kind of space was probably writing. Uh, but writing, especially for UK publications, it's almost impossible to be able to eat at the end of the month and just right. do that. Yep. And so then it was uh, you know, filming and photography and, and podcast and the other stuff and the commercial work like you were talking about. Um, and the last year has, has really shown that if I was just a photographer, I'd, I'd be kind of screwed, to be yeah. honest. Yep. <laughs> and it's just uh, fortunate that there was these different elements to the work that I do. But like you said, they're they're all kind of focused along the same lines. They're all having very similar kind of discussions, but they're in different mediums. Yeah. Uh, so it is, it is for people, whether you're starting out or further on in, in your career, I think it is quite important or it's becoming increasingly important to have that as a kind of safety net. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, what's so nice about this industry is really you check your ego at the door. You know, it, it's very leveling in terms of, you know, for people wanting to get into this industry. Yeah, it's fantastic. You're doing something you're passionate about, you love, you want to get up in the morning and get going. Um, but at the same time, you know, I came from being a National Geographic presenter, you know, traveling the world, traveling to go and give talks all around the world, um, you know, being on TV every night to then filming furniture commercials, you know, in Nevada and and turning into this whole different thing. And people who knew me would go, oh, my gosh, you know, <clears throat> they 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 looked at it as like this huge step down. And I, I said, you know, this is, this is a progression for me. There's no rooms for ego, right? There's no room for ego. You have to be in a place where if you want to stay in this industry and make it, for me, that's how I made it work at that time. And, um, and I think that's hugely leveling. It's really important. We see many people come and go in this industry because, um, and, you know, speaking to Rob about this, uh, Rob Nelson, when he was on the podcast that, you know, it's really, there's not, if you get, if you put a film out there and you win an award, there's this, there's two types of people. There's the type of person who think, wow, I've made it. I've just won an award. If you're out for awards, you're going to fail very fast because an award doesn't give you anything other than that, you know, that trophy on the day. Yes, it may open the door to a few things here and there but it's not going to set you up for a career. Yes, it could be used as a stepping stone, but you've just got to be very careful of, of not thinking that you're making a film to win the award because that's where it all starts from. Cause it really isn't, you know, it's just people in this industry understand that if they get an award, it's a great accolade. You know, you've been compared to other things out there. You've done a great job, but it doesn't mean you're set for life. You know, this is a, it's some a, great advice there. Yeah, great advice. It's hard, hard industry to be in. You've got to have the love for the game. If you want to be in it, that's, that's as simple as that. And I think everyone who you've probably spoken to and, and myself on the podcast, uh, you know, will, will, uh, reiterate that and, and say that many times. Yeah. I, I, one other thing I'll just add before I kind of move on to the, maybe one of the last things we'll talk about is that, you know, I'm, it's, I'm kind of, I'm on the periphery of the industry for want of a better word, because I have the, I'm in the fortune position where I get to interview people like yourself and, and Rob and, and Nick Baker. Um, but the the one thing that I've been blown away by is that well, one, it really is a very small industry because, especially in the wildlife documentary, the wildlife human interaction documentary space, everyone seems to know everyone else. Yeah. But everyone that I've dealt with has also been incredibly nice. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And and really helpful. Yeah. The, the people who are involved in it, who have gone through the journey, like the one that you've been telling all the listeners are very willing to help other people because you understand the challenges that are in front of people and you understand this kind of deep-seated passion and reason why people want to pursue it. And and the fact that it, it really is quite difficult. It's not, a, it's not an easy road, but my experience of it is that it hasn't been um, – you know, a whole heap of people who have done really well and been very successful wanting to keep other people out. It's been a very encouraging sort of community of people inside that space. Yeah, hundred percent. And and like I said, you you check your ego at the door, you know, there's no there's no room for that. It's a small industry. Uh, everyone helps each other out. You know, you can pick up the phone and speak to someone if you're having a problem with a particular project and they'll help in any way they can. Um, that's because there's a bigger 
a bigger thing at play. And that's, that's, you know, the, the industry as a whole is all aiming to do the same thing. You know, we, there's not really any room for a person coming in and just trying to become the, the you know, a, a star and, you know, that's it, you know, it's all about them. It's, there's, the wildlife industry or filmmaking industry is about getting awareness out there. You know, it's about making great films and putting the information out in a digestible format that can help progress conservation. And, and you know, this is really, this is quite new, um, I have to say. I mean, it's not really within terms of the industry, but broadcast in general, you know, conservation was a dirty word for a long, long time in in the filmmaking industry wildlife filmmaking because it didn't really sell tickets for want of a better analogy right it was um it, it was something that you know when you turned on the tv people didn't want to see oh this conservation issue or this issue here or this they just wanted to be entertained well that's changing now that's changing and people do want to see the issues that wildlife are facing and people do want to be educated and, and be made aware of what's happening around the world and and that's now why this industry as a whole is on the up you know for a while there it slumped but now uh, you know, the BBC are now opening up a natural history unit satellite office in LA. I mean, that I didn't has, know that. Yeah, they're about to open it up. Um, first no time way. in history, right? It's always huh. been based in Bristol. In Bristol, yeah. yeah. But the news came out a, f- a couple of months ago that they're looking to do that. So they're only doing that because it's it's huge now. And I think, you know, with the platforms like Netflix and Amazon Prime and all of the places we can just get our uh, programs when we want them, you know, I feel like I think we're probably all um, we're probably all like this to some degree, right? One one night you f- you might feel like watching a Hollywood flick, but then there's the time for the documentary. There's the learning time. You might want to watch something with subtitles, but not on this night because you can't be bothered to read. Right? Yeah, you want to be lying horizontal right. on the sofa, and subtitles don't really work. Like exactly. That. So yeah. you know, we all have those moments. And the nice thing with the uh, the platforms now is we can choose, right? We don't yeah. have to wait whenever we want. Whenever You're not we held want. to a certain time, yeah. like back when I was. 12 years old and it was seven o'clock on a monday night you either watched it or you missed it yeah and and i think that was the restriction now there's no restrictions so these programs are getting you know unbelievable uh, viewing figures and um yeah and so it's becoming you know it's really peaking and it's peaking in a place where it's about conservation issues and it's about learning about what's happening in the world and and that's our focus it's not about focusing on the individual and our successes it's about what can we all do as a whole as an industry to really you know make the world a better place and i think i I think that's a fair statement of the industry. Yeah, I think it is. And I, I think that's a, a beautiful lead in to one of the last things I wanted to speak about, which was the short doc that you've put out called uh, Reconnecting, Reconnecting Wild and Restoring Safe Passages, which is um, allowing, which is a, a, a doc about allowing uh, animals to traverse this landscape that has been shaped by humans and do it in a safe manner how did this tell me a little bit about more about uh, this this project and, and the film and how it came about sure yeah it um it came about when i was contacted by um arc solutions who are a non-profit who basically are, are, are there to raise awareness about wildlife corridors um, and they got in partnership with uh, Nevada Department of Transportation, or NDOT. And um, NDOT had just uh, finished, or actually not not the time, but the time they were just embarking on building two of the largest overpasses in Nevada uh, for mule deer. And now Nevada have been historically kind of a model state for the rest of the U.S. They now have, I believe it's 10 or 11 overpasses throughout the entire state. I think six of those, I may be wrong with these figures, but somewhere around six of those are down south and five of them are up north. So many of them around Vegas. Uh, But these particular two that Arc Solutions wanted to um, bring awareness to uh, are up in northern Nevada, about five hours away from where I'm at. And so they contacted me. They'd seen my work through my website and various other places working for nonprofits. And they contacted me and said, would I be interested? And absolutely, I would. You know, I I jumped on a call with them and the Department of Transport. And, 
we we got together a script and and basically went from there you know they they asked me would this be something i was interested in doing because of its nature of being again wildlife kind of coming into uh, it's not really an urban area because it's, it, it's a very sparse area but it's uh, the overpasses are crossing the interstate 80 the i80 uh, main highway that runs through nevada from the uh, the east to the west um, this interstate is so highly used by companies like amazon uh amazon distribution centers either end of it uh tesla with the gigafactory on that road um there's fedex and ups uh distribution centers you know either end of it as well so it's a heavily used road um And so, you know, I fell in love with the project because, again, it was kind of wildlife coming from their, you know, wildland areas to an urbanized area. It's just a road, but it's, you know, it's us impacting the landscape. Um, And so I filmed over a two-year period. I only spent 20, 21 days in the field, um, but it was over two years. Um, And starting out really filming the road before anything had any um, uh, mitigation had taken place. So they were starting to build these overpasses. Um, And I was able to film the chaos on the roads of these deer, four and a half thousand deer within about a month's period coming across and trying to cross this crazy busy highway. Um, And I should say for anyone listening as a disclaimer right up front um, or a preface right up front that there is, um, you know, I guess you call it a distressing scene right at the opening scenes. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, we've had... We've had a it's, lot of uh, yeah, <laughs> a lot of comments about that, but but uh, it's it's not it's for a very specific reason that you're showing this. I think that there is a, a there is a risk sometimes with um, showing traumatic scenes, whatever that might be, on film that it that you're doing it for like a shock factor and yeah. a shock factor alone. Whereas this is really to show the reality of the problem on the ground yes 100 percent. and so I, I support your decision to include it <laughs> thank you i appreciate it well you know the clients came to me and they said oh we, you know we're not sure about putting that in and i said to them this i just said look you are all about raising awareness and this is a tool for you to raise awareness by not putting it in there you're basically pandering if you like to the people who you think you're going to upset who are really already on board with this kind of thing. What you've got to do with these kinds of tools is, is change the minds of people who aren't on board or who aren't, who don't really care. And the only way you're going to do that is by shocking them into it. If you like, I mean, this is harsh way of saying it, but, but at the end of the day, if you want to change someone's mind, then get their attention. And the point of that is to get their attention because uh, at the end of the day, the scene is a collision shot of a deer being hit by a truck. And actually it's a very clean kill, which is why I used it. There's many, many messy kills on that road, but this was very clean. And it was actually the deer running into the side of the truck, not actually being hit by it. Um, but the point of that is to say, you know, if I if if the narrator tells you that this road has, you know, hundreds x many, you know, road um, ca- collisions with a with deer uh, in a year or in a month or in a day, whatever it might be, then you'll go, oh yeah, okay, you know, I, you know, I, I know people hit deer on the road, you know. But you see it instead of just being like, oh, yeah, I know you go, you gasp and you go, oh, my gosh, you know, it's suddenly it's got your attention and it means a whole lot more than just being told it. Um, I had the um, the pleasure um, of watching and this was just before everything shut down here, February last year or January last year. I went to the Wild and Scenic Film Festival. The film's been in 13 film festivals and and won an award at one of them. and I had the pleasure of being in the audience and giving a Q&A afterwards to an audience, which was the last one. The other 12 festivals were all virtual for obvious reasons. Um, but what was so great was to see the hundreds, of, actually there was a couple of thousand people in the room, and to look at how they changed and how within the first, that, that clips in about the first 10 seconds. And what happens is when there's an interim between two films playing, 
what happens is people start talking and then they're shuffling and then that you know as a film starts playing there's this shuffling settling down period right where it's people moving their their feet or you know a bag of chips or crisps you know crankling or something like that there's this calming down period that can take minutes into a film and can be annoying if you're a filmmaker right <laughs> wanting people to take note yeah, well that like, was happening i spent a lot of time establishing these That's opening right. 10 seconds be quiet yeah exactly <laughs> that that was happening until that deer hit and i tell you yeah. it, there was this huge gasp in the room pin drop. and then you could hear a pin drop mm. and it was fantastic because that was the point and straight away i had the attention of every single person in that room then what happened is they watched it and then there's another scene in there where a deer is on the road and people and it doesn't get hit but but people assume right because they've seen one they think oh my gosh i'm gonna see it again so there's this right the whole room you could literally feel the atmosphere change gasping again and then there's this settling down but for the 12 minutes of the film i had their undivided attention which um, is why that film, I, I wouldn't say, you know, I mean, I, I made it, I, I, I filmed it, I produced it, I edited it. Um, you know, I rewrote the script for it, that kind of stuff or, or reposition. I mean, I didn't write it. I asked the questions. It was told by interview, uh, interviews and interviewees. But, um, the point is that that was my intention and that's what it did. I wouldn't say it's the best film thing in the world, but it got into film festivals, I believe, because it made, uh, you know, it raised awareness, and and that was the whole point. Yeah, our our thinking on, especially when we're putting in road systems um, at home in the UK and in, in much of the world, has changed. Thankfully, where we are considering what the impact of wildlife is more and more, probably still not enough. I know that there. I was at um, P twenty two day here. I guess more than a year ago mm-hmm. in LA, um, which is all about their their their, their sort of resident LA uh, mountain lion P22. Yeah, I spoke and... on one of their live events, yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Um so uh, they were raising or well, one of the one of the main drives of that day was raising money for a a an overpass, a, a wildlife crossing because a, a lot of mountain one. lions get killed yeah. and uh, it's a huge one. Yeah. I mean, I like think in lanes I think it's going over. Yeah, they at the time, and maybe the, there was probably more money has been raised now. But I think back then there was thirteen million dollars had been raised yeah. for it. Yeah, uh, I think the last time I saw it was around thing. fourteen, fifteen million mark. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I can't be too far off. Yeah. But it's in some places, particularly some countries in Europe, um, they're really good at it, and they do it a lot. Uh, where, you know, whether it be for squirrels crossing the road or it be for deer crossing the road, they do implement it. We're not very good at doing it at home uh, in the UK, although yeah. I am seeing an increasing awareness and need for it. Um, so yeah, it's I mean it's highlighted in in this film, which I which is on your website, but uh, is also on um, your Nine Caribou Productions yeah. on YouTube. I think so I think the thing that it. made it so easy for Nevada, and I don't want to say easy, but probably easier, was the fact that there's so much space here. You know, and so um, Nevada is one of the least populated states in the U.S. So they have the room to play with, and I think that's that's the biggest kind of uh, roadblock, if you like, excuse the pun, but um, <laughs> roadblock to this happening in other places that are more built up. But is the space? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hopefully but, but, that will change. But yeah, hopefully, and and you know, it's one thing implementing these changes in something that already exists, but we're always building new road networks and new man-made constructions and just being more sympathetic to what that impact is on wildlife is important and yeah. it is it is happening more and more i think the last time i can remember having an in-depth discussion on this it was to do with i actually sit on as a trustee on the esk rivers and fisheries trust back at home and they wanted to put some turbines in the estuary uh, near montrose to generate power for a factory there. And there was this 18-month uh, um, research that went on off the back of it. Eventually, they never ended up putting them in because they they decided that it was there was too high a risk that it was going to impact the migration of salmon and sea trout in that river, which had already declined markedly right. over the last 20 years. But it's considerations like that, whereas if you turn the clock back, I don't know, maybe only 40 years, 50 years, 
they probably would have just done it. Yeah, absolutely. The, the yep. environmental consideration just wouldn't have been there. No. And that is a positive. No, I right think direction. I think you know it's um it's just raising people's awareness of why these the, these um you know uh, structures in the case of the deer need to be there. You know, there was a lot of backlash. I did a film uh, eight or nine years ago on pronghorn in Wyoming, and it was the same thing. It was a, a, an overpass that had been put in next to a community. And the Department of Wildlife and Transport were having a huge problem with many of the residents who were up in arms about it. And the reason they were up in arms, and this is goes back to something you were saying earlier about not understanding the, the factual information, right? They heard that this overpass was costing, and I can't remember the exact figure, but millions of dollars, right? Let's say $2 million, um, which, which is an average cost of these things generally. They heard it was costing $2 million, and they just assumed that that money was coming from the infrastructure growth of their community or you know, the, the pothole filling, the maintaining of the infrastructure. Yes, yeah, so they were going to lose out something so they were by lose this out. being put in place. And yeah. so it was, uh, yeah, it was basically, we're going to lose something if you do this, which wasn't the case at all because those funds are actually encumbered from uh, grants and pools of money that are set aside for this type of work. So if you if you apply for those grants to put one of those overpasses in and you get it, then that it, that money is for that. It doesn't come away from anything else. And if you don't use it for that, you can't use it for anything else. It has to go back. So it, you know, it was just a lack of facts. And, and so they ended up having to do a massive amount of outreach to the community to try and get them to understand that. And really the point of this film is to try and highlight some of those things. Say, look, you know, these are being built. They govern uh, the, um, federal government are now putting larger amounts of money uh, aside for this kind of infrastructure. And as you were saying, you know, it's far easier to put these infrastructures in when there's there's new uh, infrastructure growth, right? When you're when you're building up an area, you're putting a new highway in, that's the time. It's much cheaper to put an overpass in for wildlife at that point, or an underpass for that matter, than it is to come back and do it later. And so, you know, one of the last things I'll say about this is just we've, we've had incredible amount of feedback about this show. Um, I mean, it's a 12-minute show and already we have passed um, on contacts to Arc Solutions and the Department of Transport. These contacts are people who are looking to do large-scale implementation of uh, wildlife crossings. Um, I can't say much about it, but only that this awareness has been, you know, uh, raised, if you like, to the point where now organizations saying, okay, you know, there are multiple ways we can do this. Let's come together and see if it's possible. And that's the start of a very big conversation. And, you know, the fact it's come from the film is, is fantastic. You know, that's, and that's the point. That's uh, the like, point. I'm sure I know that from this conversation that we've been had, I get, and it's the same for me is I want to create things that, that change a narrative, that change mindsets, that inform people, that actually make a difference in a way. And here, you know, you're looking at something, as you said, it's like it, it's a 12 minute film. It doesn't have to be a one and a half hour um, feature length documentary to really make an impact. Absolutely. Um, yep. And that for me is like, that is the, the biggest achievement of anything that I put out there, whether that be a piece of writing or film, is knowing that it made a difference in some way. Yeah, and, and that should that's be, the ultimate prize. Yeah, I think for anyone listening who is looking to get into this industry, a great takeaway here is that is exactly that that it doesn't need to be, you know, a one and a half hour special with David Attenborough. Certainly, <laughs> it would be nice if it, it was, but. Nice. But it doesn't have to be that to make an impact. And I yeah. think um, when I was speaking to Nate Dappen uh, on the podcast, um, he mentioned this, that, you know, you can, I think this was one of his bits of advice is rather than looking to try and get into the film festivals with a one and a half hour, you know, special that costs, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and you know, years of your time, make a three minute film with great impact. 
right? That raises awareness because that three minute film has a place in those film festivals and you can win an award that's just the same size, right? And has <laughs> the same meaning with that three minute film than you can an hour and a half uh, special. So that that's massive because look at the resources that you need to make, uh, you know, a, a long, I mean, an hour long doc, an hour and a half you've really got to have a good story and you've got to know how to tell a story to keep people really interested. And probably just more than you, with just like more oh, than yeah. one person with yeah. a camera. It's, it takes a lot. It takes a huge amount of resources. But for, to yeah. make a three-minute film, you know, most of us can do that with our phones. So yeah. I'm not saying that's the best way, but, but you know, there but it's are possible. ways. It's possible. Yeah. yeah. And you can win awards that way. So, you know, which again, <laughs> it's just the start. <laughs> It is. Jake, it's been a great conversation with you today. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I encourage people to go over and listen to your series. You have 30 or so shows right now on, on your podcast. Yeah, I think it's a good, I think the next one is 28 or 29 okay. episode going out. But we get one a month at this moment, and hopefully we'll build that up to more eventually. And just remind people uh, how they can find it if they go and search on wherever they, they listen to podcasts. Sure, yeah. they can Basically, it's anywhere you find podcasts. So iTunes, Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, Google Play, Amazon, uh, all the big names. It's, it's out there. It's the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast. And, uh, and yeah, if you pop that in or just my name, Jake Willers, you, that will come up for you. And the places where people can follow you on social and website and all that. Yeah, and I, I'm pretty terrible at social media, so <laughs> you can follow me by all means. But <laughs> um, that's good to know. Yeah, so um, Jake Willers uh, YouTube channel is Jake Willers, so um, that's probably one of the best places. That there's also the podcast is now being filmed on Zoom, so you can actually go and watch it on YouTube under just Jake Willers. Um, there's also the Nine Caribou channel, uh, Nine Caribou Productions, where you can see the film reconnecting wild reconnecting wild is um there's parentheses or brackets around the re at the beginning so yes it's i noticed that open Smart. parentheses re close parentheses and then it's connecting wild restoring safe passage uh that can be seen on youtube and uh, many other places i mean just google it and it does come up uh, and then really i'm found at jake willers you know facebook and um uh, instagram uh, jake thank you uh i hope that uh, we get a chance to meet in the field at some point. Absolutely, I'd love to pick yeah. Your more. Do you make it to festival wildlife filmmaking festivals much? Um, I have done in the past a little bit, um, but maybe you know I, this was. <laughs> I, w I should have been at the International Wildlife Film Festival in Montana uh, this not not this year last year yeah. because um, I got one of the scholarships there, but oh, of course nice. it was cancelled. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, yeah, I, well, I, I mean, I'd like to do more. I think when when everything does open up again, I will definitely have a desire to to socialize and and do that kind of thing, you know, just to see people again. Yeah, it's so nice to you know go to those and as I say it's a small group of people. So once you start going to those, they become a, a little family of their own, yeah. you know, very quickly. So I'm sure we'll we'll meet at some point at one of them. Well, thank you very much, Jack. Great to speak to you. Thank you. I appreciate being on. <laughs>